Well, when I got settled down in this, uh, from uh, Munich, we rode just the box cars over to uh, Krims, Austria, which was Stalag 17B. And uh, the night we got in there, it must have been about in November, October or November. Well, uh, we got settled down there and I had another one of those pass out, heart attack now, see what the other. And uh, anyway, got pretty good treatment there in uh, Stalag 17. Every morning they bring us a half of a key, uh, uh, a half a barrel of hot water, and we had a few groceries. But they give us a, about three times a week. They give us a bread ration, or a, and a potato ration, and they keep those things, you know, eat on them, and then. Uh, they give us some German coffee, they call it the Ersatz. And uh, we survive on that. And uh, being as a sergeant, didn't have to work any. But time would have passed off a lot sooner if I had. We had two or three people that saw different kinds of classes. We had a Philadelphia lawyer there, and he taught business law, and it was interesting. And we had an, uh, one, that Johnny Gutierrez, he taught Spanish, and I took over with every course that he had offered. So I um, growing up in and on a ranch and living on the border. I spoke some Spanish, but it's all pertaining to the ranch work and things like that. But, uh, when I came back, I showed him, he made some diplomas, went to, took for a, almost a year and a half. They gave me credit, college credit for eight hours of Spanish. And it helped me, because after I got out and was in college, it went to Mexico, worked down there for a couple of years. And so it all paid off. Learned some of his Spanish. Life wasn't bad in the prison camp. We uh, were right next door to 10,000 Russians. There was almost 5,000 Americans, and most of the time, most of the time, it was all airmen for the first time. We were. And then others got to come in because they got captured or shot down near that camp. And uh, they called us out twice a day for roll call, morning and night. The food wasn't real good, but I managed. The Russians were uh, treated real badly. All, every rank had to get fall out and work. We'd see them going by our our compound every morning. Generals on down. They did not belong to the Geneva Convention, and uh, for some reason they never got in Red Cross parcels. We got Red Cross parcels occasionally. It was a pound of uh, powdered milk, a half pound of sugar, and. Uh, always three to five packs of cigarettes, which I didn't smoke. But the uh, guys that did, they'd trade you, oh, we got this D-bar, and we had a can of uh, either salmon or bully beef. But whenever the, the Germans were given to us, they'd always punch a hole in those cans so we couldn't save it up, because they always expect us to try to get away. And we dug tunnels. We dug tunnels over into the Russian compound. There, there was, it, was, it was only about 40, 40 feet at the most that had to go there.
the reason we had a Russian uh, tunnel to the Russian compound so we could uh, get better acquainted with them, I guess. Just, just have something to do and confuse the Germans. As the Russians were coming into Vienna back in uh, I guess January and February, we kept up pretty close touch with them. Uh, in February, probably of uh, '43, they got into Vienna, and boy, they were sacked it because the f smoke was going up way up there. And so they started uh, moving us with groups of 500 back toward the American lines. And the group that I was with, we took off and were beside the Danube on the day that uh, after Roosevelt died. I believe that was about the 12th of uh, April of 45. Seemed like that's about the date. The, uh, and nobody knew who Truman was. One guy finally figured out, he was from Missouri, he figured out who Truman was. But um, anyway, with that, in the group, the guards got, the guard got to know you after a while, and I always had plenty of cigarettes because I didn't smoke. You know, we played poker for cigarettes, food. So I was going to tell you about the mail, yeah, the mail. About two months, I think, after I was shot down, I got a letter from home. I was able to write home. And then I think it took them about two months to ever get a letter from me. And then they found out my address, and they, they, my folks would send me a letter. And they found out they could send me a, a kind of a care package deal. And I, I got that in about a couple of months. And uh, is tobacco was such a hot item, item to every nationality. Well, I got to send $2 to, to R.J. Reynolds Company, and they'd send me a carton of uh, cigarettes. Well, I've told them to change that to Prince Albert in the can because that was a good trading material. The uh, prison life wasn't that bad as far as I was concerned because having lived on a ranch all my life, I could survive Guys from uh, Chicago and other places, you hear a lot of complaining about the food. But uh, we got a few Red Cross parcels, a few Red Cross parcels, and uh, help. Always in that Red Cross parcel, there was a pound of oleo margarine, which I never cultivated a taste for. But they were real good to make you a light out of. You, you'd plant a, you'd take some cloth and kind of plait it together and dip it in this old little margarine and get saturated with it. And it made a wonderful, we called it the butter lights. We played cards with them and the guys in the three-story bunks, they complained because they said the, the soot got in their nose and all that. And I guess, guess it did, but we kept playing cards all night. The only old was about as useless an instrument as uh, people could think of to put in, a, in the package. We'd have a, a D bar and a little sugar and a little coffee, and, and uh, it was enough things in there to, for one guy to survive on 10 days. Or you could divide up among ten men for one day. And we got a few of those through the International Red Cross, which was very, and always three to five packs of cigarettes. 
usually good cigarettes. Lucky Strike, a few Chesterfield. Most of them didn't like Chesterfield. I didn't, don't know why. It's all sand to me, but I never used to smoke. My tail gunner used to smoke. I'd keep him in cigarettes. I contributed to his delinquents as much as could, I guess. But that was the most valuable thing there. When we were playing poker, they always had the cigarettes the most valuable thing. Next to D-bars and things like that, a few, a few D. But any time we had a can with uh, bully beef or salmon or anything like that, they'd stick a bayonet in it where we couldn't save them up. But, uh, and then after a week or two, if you want to open it up, you just open up the can and cut that bl blue stuff off and throw it out. And the Russians would come over there sometime and they'd pick up what we throw away and eat. We would use the uh, oleum sometimes to stop up the, the holes in the can that they punctured. The bedding was uh, real comfortable. We had burlap bags as a container and then we had some straw in there. And it wasn't too bad. You got accustomed to it. It's always slept with all your clothes on in case you had to run. And uh, keep warm. It got pretty cold some nights. But I never suffered because somewhere or another we got some bullet from these regular army blankets. They had U.S., you know, so we knew these all wool blankets. I don't know, uh, I got, you know, after all these years, I got to figure out there kind of had to be some kind of communication through some source. It might have been the International Red Cross. But Germans and Americans, they were uh, kind of buddies, more so, oh, ten times better than, than the Russians. When I'd get out and uh, people were moving toward the American lines instead of waiting there for the Russians. There's two places I went to to trade, and they, they wanted me to stay there until the Russians went by. Because they, when we were in uh, Krems, it was only about 25 miles down to Vienna. And as far as I know, that's about as close as the Russians came to by us. They didn't come into that Stalag 17 because all the fellows and I couldn't move. Some of them sick and and the camp commander was Ken Kortenbach. Kurt, he stayed there and uh, the German doctor asked him to stay in his house because he had two girls, young girls. And he, uh, he and, and the, the camp commander, we just elected him, uh, he's a sergeant, we elected him to, in the voting process, that's where we did our no poll tax or anything, but uh, we voted him in. Then I saw him in Albuquerque and he died in a family. But he stayed there and protected them until the Russians went by. Once they saw Americans there, well, they wouldn't mess with it. Fritz was our favorite guard. He came in to raise the thunder. He said, Fritz, calm down. Have a cup of coffee. He said, you crazy Americans. Said, you never take anything seriously. Said, that's why you can't win a war. So, the next war I get into, I'll, I'll take things pretty seriously. Uh, he brought me bread if I ever, if I won't need it, and I'll give him cigarettes. He said, in Vienna, a pack of cigarettes is worth $12. 
Well, I had more larceny in my blood then than I do now. I said, friends, I got a good deal for you. We'll divide that. You bring me six dollars and I'll give you another pack of cigarettes. He said that he would, but except they wouldn't let him out of the gate. Take him, uh, I could give him a sum and he'd break the pack. If he broke the pack, he could, he could uh, get out with that, but he couldn't get out. So he said, maybe we can get you through the hospital and you trade places with one of the workers, Englishman. English can work. We didn't have any Americans in our camp that could work. It had to, according to the Geneva Convention, if you are a sergeant or above, you didn't have to work. That might have been one reason that we were all sergeants, I don't know. It wasn't on good behavior, I'm sure of that. And uh, he said, you trade places with an Englishman. So the English chaplain came over one time and I gave him 200 packs in a shoebox full. And uh, I told him to hold them, use, take what he wanted, and uh, I'd be over in the English compound and see we worked out this deal. Well, a couple of Sundays went by and he never did show up again. Then another one came over and I said, where is uh, Father so-and-so? He said, oh, they moved him out last week. I said, did he leave a package there with my name on it? He said, no, I haven't seen it. So. I guess it went to a worthy cause anyway. Plus, plus 200 packs. <laughs> Some of the guards we had had been on the Russian front. And if they gave us a lot of static, we'd invite them back toward the, Amer the Mexico, <laughs> the Russian front. Forget what country we didn't have to. And uh, some of them were wounded, had been wounded and things like that. But uh, I guess a rule, the chairman of the cards were quite, I guess, sympathetic toward us because we took pretty good care of them. And then when uh, they started marching us back toward the American lines, the civilians, they were real uh, helpful, beneficial. I uh, would strike up with one farmer. I, I learned enough German to ask for brood and air, eggs and things like that. And I'd run to a farmer. And boy, it was just being hit. He'd cuss Hitler for all he could think of. He'd meet, we'd go down the road for a ways, and he'd meet his neighbor, and they'd zig Heil Hitler. They couldn't even trust one another. Their kids even turned them in the things, see. So they had to all salute Hitler every time they met another German. As we were marching through, I didn't, I didn't try to stay with the group all the time. Anytime I get out, I could. and there were two guys with me. We went to a place one night that was having a party there. Some way we were, as I remember it, we were in the middle of it. And uh, I find out uh, this is a bunch of German officers. Well, they didn't pay attention to us because we, we didn't have them. I guess that we were, didn't look like Americans, or no one had ever said, except there was a girl. She says, follow me. And she took off and followed her. And uh, we could have been killed that night, you see. We didn't even know what it was. At another time, I uh, was in this village and it got uh, night came on and I didn't I wanted to find a, a warm place to sleep. Went to this house and asked them if I could stay. See uh, so many places over there they have the barn under the house because the heat from the animals keeps their house warm. And uh, I was there and I had this log book uh, showing you with me. And there was a uh, a German soldier there, 
And he asked me uh, where I had been in the Army. I told him I'd been in the tanks in North Africa because they didn't like fliegers, flieger flyers. Because they, uh, and, and it, then it came, some planes flew over either English, see the English bombed at night and we bombed in the daytime. We were the first daylight bombers they had over there. And uh, they got all, all excited and I went down into the, uh, to the uh, barn down below the house and uh, some hay there and there's an old sheep in there. She had a big old lamb that night and the biggest darn sheep I ever saw. And uh, next day when well, I got up and moved, moved out to a safer climate, but I, I enjoyed my tour, touring around and getting, getting acquainted with the people because they, were, they knew this thing had to be coming to an end because they knew that the Russians were coming in one way and the Americans were coming in the other. And when we were on this, uh, coming back toward the American lines, in April of 45, the guards would tell us where we could stay, where we were going to stay tonight. And if it happened, it was, well, it wasn't too bad. And we would just stay where we had to carry everything on our backs. And every evening, I get my tail gun and I got shot down two days, but he got shot down on my Swineford raid two days before I did. But when we, when we got to, in the Stalag 17, we got together and uh, he was from Kansas City. And uh, he would take my uh, bed in and my backpack where we were going out night, and I'd take off to the furthest farmhouse I could find and start trading tobacco for food. And uh, people were always glad to see it. These old farmers, they would, I'd, I would never trade them a can of, of uh, tobacco. I'd give them part of a can. They'd take a little in their hand and kind of inhale it. They hadn't had any tobacco in seven years. And while they felt that Prince Albert was, was the best thing in the world, they'd been smoking Timothy Hay. And I watched one of them, he'd take a little bit of tobacco and mix it with his tin of Timothy Hay and still smoke it because I didn't trade them enough to. But the, they would pull uh, things out of their, their chimneys, food like uh, pork and things like that, where they had hid from the soldiers or anybody else. And uh, I always got plenty, plenty to eat along the way. One day we were coming by a field and the people, three or four of them were up there planting, planting potatoes. And potatoes, if you had a section them up, maybe a quarter of one, or three or four pieces. And they were putting them in a the, in the field. Well, I knew enough, I gathered up a few of them while they were going the other way and take them down to the creek and wash them off and we got plenty to eat that way because we didn't have this had kind of but do our own thing when when there's we only going back toward the American lines. The Russians were coming up from the east and the American lines were coming in from the west. And uh, all the people were trying to come towards the American lines. And some of them tried to get me to stay with them until the Russians went by. Because they knew they, they thought they'd get better treatment, I guess, from the Americans. But I never did stay over with one or two nights, that's all I ever stayed out. For uh, a pack of cigarettes and things like that, any, anything, the guards were glad to get them, you see. And he, he didn't care. The first three days that we were coming out from uh, Krems, Austria, the guard told me, I guess he told the other guys too, I'm sure he did, said the SS troopers are with us, but said, stay, better stay in line. And one guy came back one day with, with a bullet had just grazed his coat 
like that. And boy, he got in the center of the line. He never got out. So we could, after three days, he said to the, the SS trooper from Wetless, so then I started going out, and he didn't know where we'd stop. And the, um, uh, I trade with the people. When the Russians came into Vienna, they started moving us back toward the American lines in groups of 500. And then they had, they had, we had some two or three guards, one five hundred dollars. And uh, after we got away from uh, the Danube area, they just kept taking us along. And that's when I would get out and go visit with the civilians. What a town I went into, and uh, the card was right there. And the gal threw me a potato, you know. Sometimes you got to get a little hungry because the Germans didn't feed us anything. They may have tried to once or twice, but I had better food. I would go out and trade and break it in. Eggs were uh, pretty valuable, and I, I treated a little tobacco for eggs and things like that. And uh, this girl threw me a potato, and this, this guard looked at her, he could have shot her. You see, they had, they had the ability, I mean the permission and all that, to do anything they wanted to, those German guards did. And, uh, I was uh, in, I think, the same town, and I had a bar of the Sweetheart Soap. My folks had sent me uh, kind of a care package. It was toothpaste and all those things in there, and it had to be a bar of that. And I just smell of it, you know. I thought, this might uh, come in handy if the right person. So we were negotiating. I was these two or three of these gals, and uh, I finally got up nine eggs. They gave me nine eggs for that. I let them smell it, you know, smell it. It's dark there. Like and finally got nine eggs out of it. So that was the most valuable thing, except for Prince Albert in the can. The war was over the 3rd of May. I believe the second, first or second of May, we woke up one morning and the third and the seventh army had overlapped and they came in there. And a little boy in the seventh army came to us and said, you guys are free. We scattered like a bunch of quail. I went to a town, started into it west toward the American line because I didn't speak Russian note well enough to head back to my homestead. So um, I started walking. Uh, it must have been 50 of the guys going along. There came an old boy in a wagon, and one horse was way ahead of the other. And uh, I got on the wagon with me. He said, you know how to drive a, a horse to a wagon? I said, sure, did I? I lived on a ranch when I was growing up. Well, we always had horses and wagons. So I got a road, we went into this town, and I tied the horses up outside so that the farmer could, could get them, you know. Walked into this uh, town, and it was kind of shot up. And one of this old sergeant, he said, I identified myself, he said, don't you be going around this town without a gun. And he said, down on this corner here, you'll find a whole stack of guns. You pick out of one. And down on the next block of where you'll find a lot of ammo. You get your gun. Don't be caught without a gun. So I went to our family over and under. Rifle, hunting rifle. I uh, went on down and found some shells to fit. And uh, in the process, someplace uh, somebody had stashed away a good, pretty good bicycle. So I liberated that. I didn't. I knew they were going to any place that day anyway. So I got my rifle and my ammo, 
and uh, bicycle headed back toward the camp. Rode on back to camp and they'd, they moved everybody out. They said they were going to fly us into France. Well, I had this uh, good bicycle, it was a good one. So I looked it up and it was 40 kilometers to um, some well known town back, be kind of southeast of Brown Knoll. What is it? It's a music. I can't think of what the name of it. But it says 40 yeah. kilometers. So this right. bike is running pretty good. And I'm going to head down that way because I knew I had a few free days. I went by a farmhouse and a dozen guys ran out with a, with a German uniform, but they had a big H sewed on their collar. And you could tell that this was freshly sewn on there. And I didn't, didn't know enough about what was going on, but they were Hungarians. And when Germany went into Hungary, you, they told these young, young guys, you'll either get shot or you join them. And they, they cock out with their hands up. They all wanted to surrender to me. And I thought, I got to look at them on my road map and decided I might be going the wrong direction here, you know, because I was the head of the army. So I put that bike in reverse and went on back. And the next day, or that day, maybe later, yeah, later that day, ran into an American soldier who was in this town. And he happened to be from the same town where my folks were living here brought. And he knew my sisters. And we got acquainted, and he said, uh, yeah, I'll put you up tonight at his favorite hotel. He'd confiscated a room, a three-story building at a house, and he said, you can stay there. So I went to, to his place, and he said, now don't go to that toilet on the first floor because it's booby-trapped. So we went on up to there, and he had a bed, and threw out a, uh, a feather mattress on the floor. The Germans always slept, they had a pretty good house. And I slept on that thing, and it was the most uncomfortable night I ever spent. I just couldn't get used to it, you know. Because I'd been sleeping on my uh, favorite <laughs> Any place I could. We used to, we'd sleep on the ground two or three times. One time on, when I was marching back there, we found a barn and there was a bunch of old hens were scared up in there and uh, started looking for the eggs. Found a lot of eggs where they laid. I'm, I'm sure the people didn't want them, so we had them for breakfast. Coburn and I was frying eggs one morning. Coburn wasn't much of an outdoorsman. And I drank closer to divide all my food with him and all that because he carried my backpack for a few miles. And uh, to me, it was all well and good. And they flew, they flew us back into France. I can't remember the camp thing. And uh, they said, now, don't you boys eat, drink anything at all around here. You eat what we give you because your stomach is in bad shape. And uh, I'm sure they were right. I'm sure they knew what they were doing. But uh, they said, you stay here now for about 10 days and we'll uh, get you in a good health and all that. And this friend of mine talked me into going to a local refreshment center there. And it, about dark, they ran out of the guy. They were serving us some stuff. That, he said it was bay rum. And I had never tasted bay rum, so I guess it maybe was. We started back to where Camp Lucky Strike is where we were. And, uh, we were just walking across the way, and there was a, a Frenchman out there. He was waving his arms. I thought he was greeting us. 
fell over to see what it was. He said, you crazy American, that's a minefield you just walked over. I said, well, these French are funny people, you know. <laughs> Make all kinds of sides. And I got a friend, he told us that. So we were going back there where we had, because we we have been like two or three days, and uh, there was a bunch of soldiers standing in Reveille. They worked at that camp like a strike. Behind them there, there was a pile of chicken about that high. But Clem and I went in there and kind of helped ourselves and turned around with another tent and ran into a officer. He said, what the hell are you guys trying to do? So, oh, we've been in a prison camp. We just couldn't resist stealing some of that chicken. He said, did you get enough? We had both hands of them. Yeah, this loose. <laughs> and we'd steal a rough loaf of bread every night. That bread would taste um, just like cake does now, because you know, we hadn't had enough sugar fruit. You know. <laughs> then then uh, I decided it was getting pretty confined out there, too many restrictions, so I caught a truck into uh, Paris. And uh, this truck driver said, do you have a pass? I said, no, I lost it. He said, don't worry, I got one. We went into where uh, Joan of Arc, we went through this town, Joan of Arc. We went into Paris, and I went in and took a shower at a place, and I uh, started gradually working my way back to camp, and uh, came to this place where Joan of Arc was buried. It's where they make this uh, real fancy wine, too. The priests make it. I can't remember the town. I can't remember the name of the, of the wine now. I didn't go out and see her grave, but I've been close. Got back, and Eisenhower was making a speech over in a few tents from where we were. But we had a good, good poker game going, and uh, some of the people that I knew, they were leaving, they gave me a few French francs, and, we, and I didn't even get to go over and greet Eisenhower. Had I known he'd be a president, maybe I would broke up a, instead of going to the poker game, I would stay with him. Then they said, we go to, if anybody wants to go to England, they told us where to go and get the, get on, or where do you want to go to the state? Of course, I want to get back to see Lillian as quick as I could, but uh, I detoured back and went to my old outfit and played a few hands with them and uh, saw Joan. I stayed over there for a month. Then the order came. Any American without a papers up to date, they're going to start picking them up. So I thought, well, maybe I better get them back, back home. So I went to Southampton, and 12 days later, we landed in beautiful harbor in Boston, which was the dirtiest, dirtiest place I'd ever been. And we kept sat there all night. And then the next day, they put us on the bus, gave us some orders and things, and came on down to New York. And I had to change to a train there. Came on down. Next place I got off was in Taylor, Texas. My mom and dad were down there, and my sister, two of my sisters were there. And I kept messing around in San Antonio. And they finally, the 1st of November, they gave me a uh, discharge and ended my career. I started, it, kind of started it, I guess, because I found my way to Alpine and from sugar, sugar baby. Some of the American prisoners, when uh, the Germans surrendered to them, 
they, they, they had the egg or something in their pocket, they'd mash it, you know, just for my darn meanness. And uh, I, never, I never had any ill feeling to any of them. I figured everybody was trying to do their job like I was. But it was, it was all interesting. After my junior year of high school, I went to, I was ill in this part of the country with allergies. So I went to Valentine, Texas, out in West Texas, to visit my aunt. And when I was there, uh, Leo and his family worked with my aunt and uncle. So I went, while I was with my aunt, she uh, had a visitor one day, and uh, Leo came by. And she said, let's uh, have a picnic and go out on the hill and have a picnic. So she made a picnic lunch, and the three of us went out to have a picnic. I was 15, he was 23. And uh, on the hillside came a cloudburst just as we got ready to eat our picnic lunch. And so we headed home in a hurry and we came to an arroyo that had been dry, but it was running swift and wide. So Leo jumped across it and uh, he reached out to my aunt and he said, put your hand out, I'll pull you and you jump. And they did, and she came across. So then he put his hand out to me and he said, jump and I'll pull. I jumped and he didn't pull. And I landed in the water and 67 years later I'm trying to get even with him. <laughs> so that's how I met him and then continued, I met his family and continued to know about his military life after that. I first started getting letters Several months after that, I had a birthday, after I heard that he was missing. I got a birthday card from him, but it was three months late. So it took a long time to get communication back and forth. And uh, after that, we wrote occasionally. He would write about the, the prison camp, and I wrote to him about things that were going on in college. I was coll in college at that time. and. Um, uh, we had our letters censored because I tried to tell him where certain people were and the army marked that part out and it was censored. Um, I continued to hear from him until he was liberated. He came, when he came back in August of 1945, he came to the college where I was going to school in Alpine. And he, he drove in in a 1939 Plymouth with four airplane tires. And he asked me if I'd like to go to Big Bend, Texas, which was about 90 miles away. So I said yes, I cut a class, had missed a test, and we went to the Big Bend for the day. And came back, and then he could, this was um, August of 1945 and uh, we continued to get back and forth. Thanksgiving came down to see our families. Um, were married in San Angelo, Texas in 1940. At the first time he mentioned, he said, you know you're gonna marry me, and I thought, yeah, sure. <laughs> but it, it kind of grew into this, but Thanksgiving when we came to visit the families, uh, I knew his family because I'd met him years before, and uh, he knew my family. So we came to visit both of them, and uh, on the way back I had become sick, so he took me back to Alpine. And we left early in the morning and uh, stopped off, I guess maybe you'd say the closest to asking me to marry him. Uh, he said, do you think we should stop in San Angelo and buy a set of rings? So on our way back to Alpine, we bought the rings, and I, I guess it was mutual consideration at that time. And he took me back to Alpine, and the next thing I heard from him, he was back down in Central Texas. And he had gone to ask my mother and dad for permission to marry me. And that wasn't exactly the way it was. He came and told him maybe, I don't know, he told me he asked him. <laughs> <laughs> And then we married in December, and he started college with me in Alpine and went one semester there with me until I graduated 
and then we moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where he finished his college work at New Mexico State, and I taught school, and we lived there where or some of our kids were. I decided that I wasn't going back to cowboying at $25 a month, and I wrote these things down that I'm going to get out of here and go to college. I'm going to join the church, and I'm going to join the Masonic order if they'll take me out. And in the meantime, stopped off at Alpine before I got acquainted with her before I did accomplished all these other things. Life has been good to me. <laughs> I've had several opportunities to uh, I grew up in restored B-17s, but I've always been a little reluctant because they won't give me a parachute. 